So let's summarize what you should know for exam one. Summary of Diffie Q, differential equations, and linear algebra content for exam one with the eye toward understanding how things tie together. As far as, I'm not gonna really practice problems with you here right now. I'm trying to help you put everything together in your mind. What is it all about? Summarize what you should have learned to this point in about an hour or a little less than an hour here, okay? Again, the differential equations and the linear algebra content seems pretty separate at the moment, pretty different content. It's gonna to come together in coming weeks when we get to higher dimensional <laughs> systems. So I'm gonna talk about it separately. I'll start with the differential equations, though I will mention difference equations as well here. So we start with differential equations. And in the very first text uh, section of the textbook, the emphasis is on modeling, trying to emphasize how differential equations can model quantities that change over time, like populations, amount of a radioactive substance over time, uh, interacting species, predator prey. There's also cooperative species that help each other, so to speak, and competitive species that uh, are competing for the same food sources, that kind of thing. Those are examples of interacting species models. The population models that we talked about, the basic ones are one dimensional scalar equations. So you have, for example, the exponential model, exponential model, dp dt, is some constant times P. If the constant is positive, that's exponential growth, like often happens with populations of rabbits, say. If the constant is negative, that's exponential decay, like with radioactive decay. K being positive corresponds to growth. K being negative corresponds to decay. And it is exponential, even though you don't see any exponential functions in there. Why is it exponential? It's because solutions are exponential functions. The differential equation itself doesn't have any exponential functions. But solutions are exponential functions because what you're after is, well, in this case, P is the dependent variable instead of Y for population say the rate of change of the population with respect to time is proportional to the population itself the derivative of this function of t p is a function of t is always a, a, some constant times the function itself p represents the function itself which you don't see here but you can when you think about the meaning there you can easily guess is an exponential function. We have what we call the general solution. P equals some constant times e to the kt. Okay, I'll go ahead and write it that way. P equals c times e to the kt, where c is an arbitrary constant. Any value of c will make this a solution. And it doesn't matter whether k is positive or negative. that'll be a solution for any value of C. If we add an initial condition, P of zero equals P naught, then we get a unique solution of the initial value problem consisting of the differential equation and the initial condition, two equations that have to be satisfied. I'm pretending P naught is fixed in my mind. And we get a unique solution of the IVP. P 
key equals, okay, I'm going to go ahead and use my phi notation here. Even though the differential equations textbook doesn't, you should try to get used to this and be comfortable with it. It's a function of t, but I also include a subscript to specify what the initial condition is. Yes, you should feel comfortable with this if you see it on the exam. <laughs> function of t, it really is the exact same equation as what you see here, except replace c with p naught. Up here, c is arbitrary. I mean, you could argue p naught is arbitrary as well. Yeah, but I'm thinking of it as fixed. Whether a quantity, a symbol is arbitrary or fixed is kind of just all in how you're thinking about it. I'm thinking of C as anything. And yes, P naught could be anything, but I'm thinking of it as fixed. 10 if you want. And because E to the zero is one, that's why C ends up equaling P naught. That doesn't always happen. C doesn't always equal the initial condition. But in this case, it does. You should certainly be able to check that this is a solution. Plug it in the left-hand side. In other words, take its derivative with respect to T. Simplify. Also plug it into the right-hand side. In other words, do K times the function. Simplify. You'll get the same thing. It'll, it'll be this thing times K is what you're going to get in both cases. And when t is zero, e to the zero is one, you get p zero times p naught times one, p naught. Well, yeah, let's make it tied to, to difference equations here as well. Okay, I said diffy q's there implicitly meaning differential equations. But what about difference equations? Again, it's kind of mysterious why they're called difference equations, though you might say it's fortunate since Differential and difference start with similar letters. There is there is a reason for it, but I'm not going into it. Is this kind of thing an exponential model for difference equations? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean is this kind of thing, this kind of thing. If that, what I'm about to write down is not a differential equation. No derivatives. And the function we're trying to solve for is not a function of a continu continuous variable t, it's a function of a discrete variable n. Who says t should be continuous and n should be discrete? We do, because we're just saying, pretend t is any real number, pretend n is a whole number. It's all in how you're thinking about it, but there are conventions. The current value, the current population, you might say, is a constant times the preceding population. Here, you're going to get growth, so to speak, not when k is positive, but when the absolute value of k is bigger than 1 that corresponds to growth. Why? Well, we'll come to that in a second here. And when the absolute value of K is less than one, that corresponds to decay. Now, now typically you're, you're dealing with this equation when K is positive. And so the absolute value of K being bigger than one means K itself is bigger than one. And the absolute value of K being less than one means K is between zero and one. Typically K is positive when we think about this. You can think about this when k is negative, but when if you do, what happens is the, the numbers bounce back and forth between positive and negative values, which doesn't make sense much sense for applications, or at least most applications. So we mostly think about this model when k is positive, but this one we can think about when k is positive or negative. What's your general solution? Let's use purple. General solution, you could say Pn 
is an arbitrary constant times, what would it be? It turns out to be k to the m. You could call that an exponential function of n if you wanted to. A different kind of exponential function than this. Here we have base e, and the k makes an appearance as a multiplier of the t, continuous variable t. Here the base is k, not e, same as the k that's right there. And the exponent is a discrete variable n, taking on whole number of values. What's the initial condition? Uh, I guess you'd say P naught equals P naught. There's not much to say there for the initial condition. So the unique solution of the IVP I don't use the phi notation with this. C ends up equaling P naught. You get P naught times K to the N. Could I use a function name here? Maybe another Greek letter like psi or something? Yeah, I could, but I just don't. When you realize this is your solution, it helps you understand why k be, being bigger than one in absolute value corresponds to growth and being less than one in absolute value corresponds to k. Because if you take a number bigger than one there, like two or even 1.1 and raise it to higher and higher powers of n, that's gonna be growth. Whereas if you take a number between zero and one, like 0.9 or 0.5 and raise it to higher and higher powers, it goes to zero. With this kind of function, you know you have growth as t goes to infinity when k is positive and decay when k is negative. So those are the basic, the, the most important basic model in chapter one. You might even call this kind of thing the most important basic model for the whole course. Because what we're going to do in chapters two and beyond is generalize this. k is going to become, well, p is going to become a vector. k is going to become a matrix except we won't call it K, we'll call it capital A, because that's what we're used to using for matrices. Yes, you heard me right. P or Y, if you use the Y, will become a vector, a column vector, and the K, which we'll call A, will become a matrix. So you can say this is the most important kind of equation for the entire course here. And, and what happens down here in the vector matrix case is also, very similar to what you see here. But once again, the P and the P naught are vectors and the Ks are matrices. Yes, E to a matrix power times T. We're going to do that. E to a matrix power? Yeah. Oh, it's so much fun. It's called the matrix exponential. And it is a matrix. E to a matrix power times T is itself a matrix, it turns out. A matrix to the N power is also a matrix. So I'm spending a, a while emphasizing the very first thing from the very first lecture here, which is related to the very first section. And we've done other things, but I think this, it's important to really emphasize this. This is where the unity between the courses, is the uh, differential equations in linear algebra is going to really come out, especially when we get to chapter three in the book. We talk about things called eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And that's also going to be related to changes of coordinates, skew coordinates we're going to see. So all that stuff that I talked about at the beginning is important. It might not have felt important, but it is really essential for the course. All right, let's go on to other things that we learned. That's sort of like worth keeping separate. Let's continue talking more about differential equations here first. I'll probably need to go a little faster. We did talk about other models, other models for population growth, for example, logistic growth. Logistic growth. Why is it called logistic uh, growth? I'm not sure. It's 
just the name everybody uses. The PDT is K times P times one minus P, or oh, excuse me, one minus P over L. <laughs> And if it's growth, K is positive. And the L is called the carrying capacity. And that's positive too. This equation complicated as it looks can be solved by separation of variables. I did do that in one of the lectures. I think you did simpler versions of it on homework. It's a quadratic on the right-hand side, but you don't see any Ts. You could divide both sides by this and quote unquote multiply both sides by dt and then integrate. It's a bit tricky, you gotta use partial fractions. You end up with like the difference of two logs on the left-hand side after you integrate and you have to combine them into one log using properties of logs, then you have to exponentiate. And it's very easy to make a mistake. If I put this on the in-class portion of the exam, probably I'd pick specific values of K and L to make it a little easier. Yes, you might have to solve it. Should be able to solve by separation of variables. On the take-home portion, it's possible I could do it more generally, maybe for an arbitrary K and L and have you show your work to confirm that or, or be able to, like if I give you the solution, be able to confirm it's a solution. How? Left-hand side, right-hand side kind of thing. <clears throat> the left-hand side is the derivative. So you whatever your function is, that's your proposed solution. You got to take its derivative and simplify it with respect to T. For the right-hand side, you're doing K times the function times the quantity one minus the function over L. Sounds like that would be crazy complicated. It's somewhat complicated. I wouldn't call it crazy complicated. You gotta be careful, but it definitely is doable. And you gotta simplify it and see that you get the same function of T in both cases. <laughs> you should be able to do that, but more importantly, for the big purposes of this course, you should be able to think about this qualitatively. What does that mean? Call this right-hand side f of p. Yeah, there's a k and then an l in there, but those are constants, so you don't have to bother with them in the notation. Unless you're reading Mathematica. Um, one thing the textbook emphasizes, and I do emphasize to some degree in the lectures, is that to think about what solutions of this look like, I mean, you would like to draw a slope field. And in lecture 8a, that slope field is also going to become some, something called a phase line. Let me talk about both of those things right now. Before you make the slope field in this thing called a phase line, it's good to graph f of p. What does f p look like? Well, it's a quadratic. Think about it. You could multiply it out. K p times one is k p, and then k p times negative p over l is negative k over l p squared. It's a quadratic function of p. Its graph's going to be a parabola, upside down parabola, because negative k over l is negative, and intercepts at zero and l, right? where this is zero, it's this factored form. Qualitative approach. Graph F as a function of P. Now realize when I do this, when I make this upside down parabola like this, that is the graph of this function f of p. This is nothing to do with differential equations right here in and of itself. 
And even if I relate it to this differential equation, it's not a solution. Don't ever, 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 ever think this is a solution. It's not. This is not a slope field. So what I dropped, because it can help you draw the slope field. That's why it's a tool to help you draw the slope field. But in the slope field, the solutions are functions of T. T needs to be the horizontal axis. And the dependent variable is P. P becomes the vertical axis. Over here, P is the horizontal axis. For what we're really interested in, the slope field and solutions, P is the vertical axis. Don't let it bother you that for one graph, P is horizontal, and for the other, P is vertical. It's okay. It's just a label. It's just different ways of thinking about things. Think about the slope field. You, you, the right-hand side function, the f of p, tells you how big the slope should be over here. It's an autonomous equation. No t's on the right-hand side. f is a function just of p alone or, or y alone if we used a y. So the slope marks are going to be constant slopes along horizontal lines where p is constant in this graph. And in fact, there'll be zero when P is zero or when P is L. All the T axis will have a bunch of horizontal slopes and this horizontal line at L will also have a bunch of horizontal slopes. And the solutions for those will be constant because solutions have to follow the slope field. Those will be equilibrium solutions at P equals zero and P equals L. Yeah, those are two const those are two constant functions that solve the differential equation because the derivative is always zero, no matter what T is. And the right-hand side, if you plug in those constant functions is always zero, no matter what T is. In between, when P is between zero and L, in this graph on the left, the output of f of p is positive. So the slopes in this region have to be positive. And in fact, they're maximized in slope at L over two. That's where the slope is largest. And the slopes get closer to zero as you approach the equilibrium solutions. And just from that amount of information, I can pretty quickly draw what solutions look like, typical solutions in here look like this. Because the equation is autonomous and these slopes are the same along horizontal lines, these solutions are actually horizontal translations of each other. What about solutions up here or down here? Well, you can draw them. The slopes have to be negative because f of p is negative. If p is bigger than l or p is less than zero, you're gonna get Small negative slopes here, bigger negative slopes up here, similar kind of thing down here. Other solutions look like this. When P is negative, that wouldn't really have any application to a population model. But when P is bigger than L, it could. If the population starts out bigger than the carrying capacity, what the model's predicting is you're going to have the population decline more bunnies will be dying and then will be born because there's just not enough food to go around. Okay. Lecture 8A, something you should watch in the next day or two. I also talk about something called a phase line. Because these solutions are horizontal translations of each other, because they're, the slope of a field is constant along horizontal lines, we could really get across the same information about the long-term behavior of solutions by ignoring the t-axis effectively and just drawing the p-axis. And instead of drawing equilibrium solutions that are constant functions, draw equilibrium points. These are equilibrium points. 
The EQ here doesn't mean equation, it means equilibrium. <clears throat> equilibrium points. As far as the other solutions, if they decrease, you make downward pointing arrows. And if they increase, you make upward pointing arrows. Now, what you're supposed to imagine when you draw this are the populations and how they change over time. If the population starts out at zero, it stays at zero. If the population starts out at L, it stays at L. Yes, bunnies are dying and being born all, all the time, but basically the population stays constant. It's, a, it's an oversimplification of real life. If the population is too high, the downward pointing arrow up here means bunnies are going to die off faster than they're born. So the population is going to decrease toward L. If the, if the bunny, population's in here, the population is going to increase toward L. Will it ever reach L? Not according to the model. It's going to be asymptotic to it. Which brings up another issue that you should have learned about like yesterday, lecture seven, A is about existence and uniqueness. I think we a little bit in six A as well. Solutions definitely exist. Well, for this model, we can find them. We can find the solutions by separation of variables. But even if we couldn't, if this right-hand side function is nice enough, like continuous, they will exist. <laughs> And if it's nice enough that the derivative of this with respect to P is a nice continuous function, they'll be unique as well. And what that means is these solutions that are asymptotic to the equilibrium solutions can't touch them. The quick summary of what uniqueness means, distinct solution curves can't touch each other. In this picture, they're asymptotic without touching. In this picture, if you approach an equilibrium point, you never actually get there in the math at least. Now, of course, in real life, you could, because the math is an oversimplification of real life. But the model, the math is predicting you are just asymptotic without ever reaching it. As t goes to infinity, as t gets larger and larger. Did we do anything with difference equations in this? Yes, we did, though it was a little extra tricky. We were talking about... a somewhat similar kind of difference equation. And if I try to do it from memory, I'll probably get it wrong. Uh, I think it might have been written like this. Something like that. I think we did, I think we maybe had a difference on the left. I might have added PN minus one to both sides. I, I'm not sure if this is right. It was in a lecture. But we had something like that. It, you had a homework problem where you had to deal with it. Solving differential equations when they can be solved involves in this kind of situation, at least separation of variables. Solving difference equations, including in this simple case up here, well, it sometimes could involve guessing, but you can also iterate the equation itself. If Pn is k times Pn minus one, and that's true no matter what the subscript is, that means this is k times k times Pn minus two, k squared times Pn minus two, and that through a little work can be seen to be k cubed times pn minus three, et cetera. This is what's meant by solving the difference equation. In the end, you get k to the n times p zero. You're just iterating. There's no integrating integration necessary, no calculus necessary. For this one, we did do iteration in the lecture and you, you worked on it for a homework problem. Uh, it was tricky. And you had to use finite geometric series formula. So if I put this on the test, it'd probably be on the take home. And again, I don't remember if this, this is quite right. Anyway, we, we thought about this in terms of solving it and predicting, seeing what it predicted. 
Does it predict something similar to what you see here with the logistic model for differential equations? No, it ends up being more complicated and wild kinds of things can happen. And in fact, you can like cross asymptotes and chaos can occur and things like that. So the difference equations, while they don't involve calculus, can actually lead to, you might call it more interesting behavior, maybe even crazier behavior. That's another big theme in, in continuous and discrete dynamical systems. I'm not going to say any more beyond that for that particular topic. What else? So thinking about the sections in the textbook, so far, what have we talked about? Section 1.1 is about modeling. And yes, there was the predator-prey model stuff, and you should understand the basic idea of at least how to identify a predator and a prey. Those were systems of differential equations. But mostly we focused on exponential model, logistic model, and in the lectures, I also emphasized free fall, both with and without irresistance. Something you, you should think about for the exam as well. Those are models. Then section 1.2 does the separation of variables stuff, finding solutions. This kind of graphical approach was talked about in the very first section, but also is talked about in section 1.3 with slope fields. I jumped ahead to talking about existence and uniqueness and phase lines, which is sections 1.5 and 1.6. I skipped 1.4. What was 1.4? Euler's method, numerical approximation of solutions. Euler's method. It's kind of like if you've had a calculus book or teacher who, who's emphasized the rule of four. What's the rule of four in calculus? Describing functions verbally. Let's see if I can get it right. Verbally, symbolically, graphically, and numerically. We're doing the same kind of thing here. Verbal descriptions of differential equations, like the rate of change is proportional to the the amount itself. And I forgot to mention Newton's law of cooling and heating was another application. In Newton's law of cooling and heating, the rate of change of the temperature is proportional to the difference between the temperature and the ambient temperature of the room. Temperature of coffee, say, and the ambient temperature of the room. Those are verbal descriptions that can be con translated into equations symbol pushing, you might say. Those are the differential and difference equations. Though to truly go as far as we can symbolically, we want to actually find solutions by separation of variables or iteration when possible. Not all equations are separable. Graphically, we think about things with slope fields. And you can make slope fields even when you can't do separation of variables. At least if you've got technology to help you, you can make them fairly quickly. And slope fields are nice. You can try to estimate what solutions look like, but they don't give you much numerical information because you may not be sure like how, what the scale is on the t-axis, for example. So then you pass on to numerical approaches like Euler's method. And let's just quickly summarize what Euler's method is again. You got a general initial value problem, first order. You should know terminology too. First order differential equation means the highest derivative is a first derivative. It's a scalar equation here because there's no vectors. It's not a system of differential equations. If the right-hand side function depends just on if it just depended on t, like does happen in the simplest model for free fall with no air resistance, it's just a constant actually, the, the rate of change of the velocity, the acceleration is 
a constant with free fall with no air resistance. So it's a direct integration with respect to T. You don't even have to bother separating variables. In the slope field, if it's an F of T, solutions are vertical translations of each other, as you learn in calculus. A function plus C, it's an additive arbitrary constant. Those are pure antiderivative problems. If it's an F of Y, that's called autonomous. Autonomous because it's independent of T is the reason it's called autonomous. Solutions are horizontal translations of each other. You can make the slope field by thinking about what the slope marks are gonna be along horizontal lines. You get equilibrium solutions. Both cases are separable with, if this is an F of Y here, you can divide both sides by F of Y and again, quote unquote, multiply both sides by DT before integrating. But in general, you might have something on the right-hand side that depends on both T and Y. And a generic initial condition here, Y of zero equals Y naught. you'd like to approximate what you hope is the unique solution of this initial value problem. Existence uniqueness, uniqueness is relevant. If this function is continuous in both variables, then the solution will exist. That's good, you're not studying something that doesn't exist. If it's also differentiable, well, continuously differentiable, the derivative with respect to y is existent is continuous, then there's a theorem that says the solution is unique for the initial value problem. Most situations we deal with, both of those things happen. There are a couple situations mentioned in the book and I mentioned in the lectures where uniqueness fails at least. And what that means is solutions will exist and be unique. And so you're not approximating something that doesn't exist here and is not unique. And you are trying to effectively approximate a curve. That'll be your solution curve, phi sub y zero of t with data, you might say. There's a t zero. Well, the t zero is, is zero. T naught is zero. This is T1, this is T2, this is T3, and these are all delta T apart. Those distances are delta T. You end up following the slope field with straight lines is what a Weathers method does. And so you really get a piecewise linear function approximating the true solution. And the second coordinates of these points are the things that are labeled y0, y1, y2, y3. And you end up doing an iteration that looks like this. This product here approximates the change in y by using tangent line approximation. So it's a difference equation. It's, it's something you do by iteration. You should know also how to implement this in Mathematica using nest list. Use nest list in Mathematica. It's a little strange, but it's something you can easily mimic and, and just copy and paste if you had to. I make a new function that I call EM for Euler's method that it has two dimensional input T and Y and two dimensional output, updating the value of T and updating the value of Y. And you use nest list to do iteration of that function. Sometimes we have to use Euler's method if we want quantitative information. But it is also emphasized, and we even emphasize in class here, that it can break down. 
there are situations where solutions have vertical asymptotes. And if that happens, or there's a method that's going to miss it, it's not even going to realize there's a vertical asymptote. That's a pretty quick summary of the main things about differential equations. Now, there are details that I hadn't mentioned. But that's a summary of what we've done with differential equations. What about linear algebra? Well, the difference equations are technically, I'm calling linear algebra, even though some of them involve nonlinear equations, like that one. Um, we also talked about coordinate systems, the basic idea of coordinate systems. Linear algebra. Of course, there's the coordinate system that's your favorite one. Ordinary rectangular coordinates, Cartesian coordinates. But you should feel comfortable if I give you transformation equations to convert to new coordinates, UV coordinates. I don't expect you to understand where I get the equations from at the moment. That's for later in the course. But maybe you've got an ordinary rectangular Cartesian coordinate system, and maybe you also have a skewed coordinate system. I think in many of my examples of visual linear algebra online, the v-axis was the same as the y-axis, and the u-axis was something different from the x-axis. But in theory, they could be both different. You could go this way, and v could go that way. And you can think of it in terms of graph paper as well. On the UV coordinate system, it would be slanted graph paper. You should understand the basic idea of how to identify coordinates based on those new coordinates, the basic idea. And again, I might give you transformation equations. U equals something in terms of X and Y, and V equals something in terms of X and Y. You should be able to use those equations. Again, you wouldn't have to figure out where they come from. That's a, that's a more advanced subject, so we're, we're waiting on that. The basic idea. Then we did um, a fair amount with vectors. Mostly two-dimensional, though, with the latest lecture, I think lecture 8B gets a little bit more higher dimensional, three-dimensional. Or is that 7B? Vectors in 2D and 3D. And you should by now start to feel comfortable with the column vector representation. Yes, this does mean 2i hat minus 3j hat. But you want to get used to, in this class, column vector representation, because that's going to be more convenient. We're taking a matrix times a vector, which is something else I need to talk about a little bit here. And how to draw them in this particular case, it'd be a vector looking about like that. How to add them and subtract them and interpret those things geometrically, parallelogram law, that kind of thing how to multiply them by scalars and do general linear combinations, how to find angles between vectors using dot product. And knowing two vectors, two non-zero vectors are going to be perpendicular, also called orthogonal, if and only if their dot product is zero. Because when, because the cosine of 90 degrees is, is zero, that's why. There's the dot product, two dot product formulas. There's the scalar version with the, with the components, and there's the geometric version with the cosine of the angle between them. Be able to find magnitudes, be able to find, uh, be able to, uh, to normalize a vector, meaning find a unit vector in the same direction as the vector itself. Projection vectors. The formula for that and then we also talk about 
the basics of solving systems of equations. Solving linear systems, both by substitution and elimination. Elimination is the main one method we're going to use. Yes, you should be able to do by substitution if I ask you. But long term, elimination is the main method to use. So make sure you practice elimination. And then ultimately, these things are also related to each other in terms of this higher level idea of linear transformations. And I think what's most worth emphasizing our last five minutes, five to 10 minutes before I let you go here is this linear transformation idea and how it's related to matrices and a matrix times a vector and some other terminology you'll learn about in lecture 8b. Do it on a new sheet of paper. What is a linear transformation? Let's say from three-dimensional space to itself, just to take pick something specific. Linear transformation in 3D, say, as just one example, I'm letting the domain be three-dimensional space and the codomain be three-dimensional space. I don't, I don't have to do that. This could be three-dimensional space and that could be two-dimensional space. Or this could be two-dimensional space and that could be three-dimensional space. Or in general, this is going to be n-dimensional space and this is going to be m-dimensional space. T is a function. Linear transformations are functions, but not any old functions, special functions with a certain domain, the set of all inputs, and with a certain codomain, the space where the outputs live. In this case, the inputs are three-dimensional vectors and the outputs are three-dimensional vectors. But again, I could have picked different numbers there. For the dimensions. The key property that linear transformations satisfy is this. T of, uh, did I use these letters in the lectures? Alpha U plus beta V. I don't remember if I used those lectures or letters or not. Where U and V are vectors And alpha and beta are scalars. This is called a linear combination of U and V. A linear combination is what I'm writing there of U and V. That this is going to equal alpha times T of U plus beta times T of V. That's the key linearity property of linear transformations. You've seen things like this before, analogous. Pretend T represents, okay, this is a little strange. Take the derivative of whatever's inside. Pretend U and V are functions and alpha and beta are constants. The derivative of a constant times the first function plus another constant times the second function is the constant times the derivative of the first function plus the second constant times the derivative of the second function. This is just like that property of derivatives. In fact, differentiation can be thought of as a linear transformation, though the domain and codomain are not R3. Not three-dimensional space. They're spaces of functions. I'm serious. We will come to that soon, but not now. This is the key property of linear transformations. What does that mean as far as a formula for T? 
if you're thinking of the vectors like in the domain as having scalar variables in the components, it means the equation that you use to define T will be linear in those variables to first powers, not second powers, not third powers, no square roots, no logarithms, no adding constants either, it turns out, if you want this property to be true. More importantly though, it also means you can define T as a matrix times a vector. T of an arbitrary vector X is gonna be a certain matrix A times X. This is T of X. This is A times X. If T goes from R3 to R3, A, the matrix A will be a three by three matrix, three rows, one, two, three, and three columns, one, one, two, three. There'll be nine numbers in the, the matrix A. This will be three by three if T goes from R3 to R3. It'll be two by two if A goes from R2 to R2. It's a little trickier if T goes from say R3 to R2, then A is, it turns out two by three, two rows and three columns, six entries. And there's a very important thing that I describe at Visual Linear Algebra Online and in the lectures on how to multiply A times X. We're out of time. Let me just say, you should definitely study that for the exam. You should know the definition of what A times X is. I will say it, but then you should go read it. It's a linear combination of the columns of A with the entries or components of X as the weights, meaning the coefficients. You can try to write that down if you want. It's a linear combination of the columns of A with the entries or components of X, the numbers, the scalars, as the weights, meaning the coefficients, like X1, first component of X times the first column of A plus X2, second component of X times the second column of A, et cetera. That description is so important for this course to understand what's going on here. Okay. First question. Good question. You would not do this multiplication if there were not the number of columns of A has to be the same as the number of components of X. Is that your question or something? Else? A times X is, it's called a linear combination of the columns of A with the components of X as sometimes they're called weights. You could also call them coefficients. They go in front of the columns of A and then everything gets added up. <laughs> you multiply those components times the corresponding column and add the results. The, the answer is a vector. A times X in the end is a vector. X is a vector and A times X is a vector. A itself is not a vector, it's a matrix. But A times X is a vector. 